turn into our Bibles uh, to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, <clears throat> we're going to look at verses 26 and verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and verse 27. In verse 26, the Bible says, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the uh, consummation which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. What we have here in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26 and 27 are two separate prophecies. In verse 26 we note that this is talking about the first coming of the Lord. It talks about, in verse 26, the Messiah. After 62 weeks, this is the scripture prophecy where it talks about what Bible students call the 70 weeks of Daniel. 62 weeks after the, the building of Jerusalem, that's nine years there, nine weeks there, excuse me, and then you got 62 more weeks, and that comes to the point of the Messiah's death. And we see there the Bible talks about the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now, folks, many of the Jewish people have believed all their lives that the Messiah would be a military Messiah and that he would come and he would, he would literally take over the world and take care of the people who were, were uh, uh, attacking them and, and keeping them under, under uh, duress, so to speak. But the Jewish people, Jewish sages also talked about a suffering Messiah. And we see also here it's speaking of it in verse 26. The Messiah shall be cut off. That's Isaiah 53. And then not for himself. That's Isaiah 53. Who was it for? It was for the Jewish nation and for the whole world. The Messiah died. Jesus died upon the cross. And the Bible says, and the people of the prince who is to come... Who is that? The prince to the come was Titus. You see, Titus was a general. His father was a general. And when his father was called back because Caesar died, the father was brought back to become Caesar. And the son, Titus, was the one in charge of the 10th legion and came into Jerusalem. So the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, that was 70 A.D. And the end of it shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war the desolations are determined. Well, by the time 135, 136 A.D., uh, Jerusalem was completely devastated. The Jewish people were scattered worldwide, and so we see this verse in 26 come to pass. But there's a very interesting word that is in verse 27. The Bible says, then he shall confirm then, after all this happens, then he shall confirm. This has not happened yet. The then has not occurred, all right? But we see in verse 27 this prediction of future desolation. Then the Bible says, he shall confirm a covenant. Who is the he? The prince who is to come. With many for one week. And so we see that there is going to be a treaty of deception. In verse 27, we see first a treaty of deception. Look at the confirmation of the covenant. The Bible says, then he shall confirm a covenant. Now that word confirm in the Hebrew is gabar, and it has a primary root word that means to be strong. To be strong, it implies actingly overbearingly. It implies to take more strength in making this made known. And really, in other words, what he's going to do to the people of Israel, he's going to make them an offer that they can't or they won't 
refuse. Like the old godfather of the, the, the godfather, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Well, he's going to be very stern, and the strength of what he's going to say is going to give them pause to accept this treaty. Now, I believe that strength comes from his uh, destruction or his claim of destruction to the Gog and Magog invasion of Israel. We don't have time to go into all of that, but I believe the Antichrist is going to take, take uh, credit for that. I think in that strength, he's going to say to them, I can give you peace. I can bring you peace. Let's drop all this stuff and let me do the work. And by the way, I'll give you your, your temple too. We see the chronology of the covenant for many for one week. Now, the designation of one week is not to be taken as a literal seven days. We've talked about that in Daniel before. The whole 70 weeks of Daniel was not talking about 70 literal weeks. But we see here that this word it, later in Daniel in, verse, uh, uh, in, in chapter 12 in verse 11 we see that these seven years are designated, seven days, excuse me, are designated as seven years. Daniel 12, 11 says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now you take the 1,290 days and you divide it by 300, which is the days of the Jewish year, you're going to come up with three and a half years. So what it's talking about is that this seven year period is that in the middle of it, in three and a half years, there's going to be something happen, the midpoint, this event in the middle of the week. You see that in, in chapter 12 and verse 11. And from the time of the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,200 and 90 days. So we see it's, the event happens in the middle of the week, the midpoint, three and a half years. So many Jews are going to join that covenant, but not all of them. Not all the Jewish people are going to believe him. How do you know that, Pastor? It says, with many. Didn't say with all. With many. So we see the confirmation of the covenant. We see the chronology of the covenant. It's going to be seven years. But look at the chutzpah of his covenant. Then he shall. What shall he do? Then he shall what? Now he's going to mimic God. And like God established a covenant with the Jewish people. Now God established a covenant with Abram. Later on to become Abraham. And he established that people... Uh, the, uh, with Abraham, not only to become a people, a nation, he said, your people, your, your, your family is going to become a nation. Now, that's, that's strong talk to a man who's childless. He has no children. His wife is beyond age of bearing. But God says, you're going to have a nation. Your family is going to become a nation. And he said, I'm going to give you this land to be the nation of Israel, so to speak. Well, the Antichrist is going to establish a covenant. He's going to settle the Middle East problem. He's going to establish a covenant with them and give them the nation of Israel to the Jewish people. He's going to give the Temple Mount to the Jewish people. He's going to let them rebuild their temple. How do we know that? Well, it says in the middle, at the, at the end of the sacrifice and offerings, well, folks, today, in the last days, there is no temple, so there are no sacrifices. You can't sacrifice. You can't go down to the local synagogue and sacrifice a lamb or, or a calf. You can't do it. You have to do it in Jerusalem. So we have to understand there has to be a temple rebuilt. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we see that the, the, this chutzpah of his covenant is simple. He's going to establish this covenant of illusion for the Jewish people thinking that he's allowing them to rebuild their temple when in reality they're building his temple. We see also in verse 27 his conspiracy of implement. Look at his egotistical double dealing in here. 
The Bible says on the wing of abomination, he shall confirm a covenant, many for a week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end. So he's going to, he's going to basically violate his own covenant. He said, I'm going to make a covenant with you for seven years. That's how we know the, the tribulation begins because Israel makes a covenant with the Antichrist for seven years. And we see his double dealing. He breaks his own covenant because he wants the Jewish people to worship him as God. He wants them to allow him to rebuild this temple so that he can use it for his worship. And now, folks, basically what this really is, is Satan going to be manifested in this man so that he can have the world worship him and the Jewish people, I'll be your God. Well, that's not going to fly with all the Jewish people. They're, they're, they're going to be very upset with that. In fact, the vast majority are going to rebel against him. And that's what we see as egotistical double dealing, but we see his excuse for destruction. Look again here in verse 27. And on the wing of abomination shall one who makes desolate even un until the consummation. Now, because of his rejection, he will stop their worship of God at the temple. He'll stop the worship of, the, the, uh, of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will not share the temple with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will declare war on the Jewish people at that point. Now, that's in the middle of the tribulation period. This is what happened at the first uh, uh, Hanukkah. This is exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did. He walked into the already built temple. He said, hey, I've got a gift for you. And he brought in a statue of Zeus, which was an anathema to the Jewish people. And as he set that up and he went out front into the altar area and he slaughtered a pig on their altar, which was an unclean beast. And, of course, made the priest to eat the pig. So make a long story short, all of this is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do in the vein of Antiochus Epiphanes. And so in reality, Hanukkah is going to happen again. The whole reasoning for Hanukkah, for the, for the desolation, the abomination of desolation that Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes brought into the temple is going to happen again because Jesus, as we're going to see, has said it's going to happen again. Jesus came on the scene several hundred years later after the Maccabee revolt, and Jesus says that this is yet to happen again. And lo and behold, beloved, it didn't happen in 70 AD. The temple was not taken over by Rome and put in a, a, a statue and a pig was... Uh, Altar on the off, offered on the altar. None of this happened. The Jewish people were allowed to sacrifice for many years until about 136 A.D. Well, even then they didn't allow the temple to be built. They destroyed everything in Jerusalem, ran the Jewish people off. Anyway, we see their excuse for this, his excuse for destruction. Look at the last part of verse 27. Finally, there's a treachery of desolation. Not only is he going to bring a, a treaty of, uh, of uh, delusion, but he's going to bring a treachery of desolation. In verse 27, look at his devious restrictions. The Bible says, and he's going to bring this wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. What he initially provides is simple. He initially provides the, the need of the temple to be rebuilt. There is no temple today. You go to Israel, smack dab on the Temple Mount area is the place where the Dome of the Rock sits. Now, I've read things, you've read things, I've heard people talk about this, that there's a guy coming out who says that that's not the original place of the temple, it's someplace else. Well, folks, why were all the people putting up their false temples on that area as a desecration to the Jewish people if that was not the area? You wouldn't do that, would you? If you want to desecrate a Jewish area, why would you put a false uh, temple on some other place? We're going to desecrate the temple area. So we're going to put our temple up there so it can never be rebuilt again. So let's build it five or six miles away from it. Doesn't make sense, does it? So we see he initially provides the temple to be restored. He'll give them permission, I believe, after the rapture. I don't believe the temple can be rebuilt until the church is gone. 
I believe there are many temples, folks. There's been the tabernacle. There was the first temple, Solomon's temple. There was the third temple. That was Zerubbabel's temple, which later on was, was uh, uh, embellished upon by Herod, and it became known as Herod's temple. It's a shame it wasn't known as God's temple, huh? And then the bottom line was that was destroyed, and now there is a temple still today. What do you mean? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. Why is the temple not built today? Why is it going to be after the rapture of the church? I believe it's going to happen in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. I believe it's going to be so prefab for in the, they already got the, they already got the, the uh, uh, blueprints. They've already got everything lined up. They've got everything inside. The interior's all done. They got everything ready to go. They just got to put it together. So it could take three and a half years to put this magnificent thing together. First Corinthians chapter three, look at verse 16. Do you not know that you are in the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. The temple today, folks, is not in Jerusalem. The temple today is in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The temple today is in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's in Washington, D.C. It's in Jacksonville, Florida. It's in Dallas, Texas. It's in uh, different places all over the world. It's in, it's in Manila. It's in uh, Beijing, China. It's in all over the Korea. That's different places. Why? Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you're not your own? Beloved, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You see, the temple was not only a place of sacrifice. Well, we know that's why the Jewish people had a temple so they could come there and sacrifice. Preacher, we know that. But you have to understand why was the temple built? It was a place where God could meet his people. God dwelt in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. When Solomon dedicated the temple that he built, the Bible says the presence of the Lord was so strong that it ran all the priests out of the temple area. They couldn't even go into the building. It was so strong. Now, there's not always been the presence of the Lord in the temple. There's no, there's no indication, no historical nor biblical indication that the Shekinah glory cloud of God, the Holy Spirit, was ever in the temple in the time of Jesus. And I tell you the reason why, because God was outside the temple walking around. But, beloved, when, when the temple was destroyed, God, at the beginning of the church era, the, history, the birth of the church, God placed his Holy Spirit in you and in me. Now, once we're removed, the fourth temple, once the fourth temple is removed, then they're free to build the next temple, aren't they? I don't think the temple's going to build when you and I are still here. Now, I might be wrong, but I don't believe that that's so. So we see what he initially provides, and then we see what he infamously prohibits Again, the Bible says, and he's going to make desolate. He's going to end the sacrifice and offerings, and he's going to make it desolate. So we see the Antichrist, like Antiochus, will place an image in the temple. How do we know that? Revelation 13, 15 says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast, to be killed. So an image of the beast is going to be placed in the temple. It's a, an image. So it's some man-made item, and it's going to speak. Could it be robotic? Could it be a, a thing? I don't know. There's some speculation. There's a lot of speculation today, folks, going on. And it's fascinating if you want to read it, but the Bible only says it's going to be an image of the Antichrist. It's going to be directly associated with him. And so we see this abomination that's going to happen. This ravagement, this ravagement. The Antichrist, like Antiochus, is going to put this image into the temple. 
Then we see his image of abomination. His image, his statue is a direct violation of the Mosaic law. God prohibits, prohibits any graven image. If you go over to Israel today and if you find a lot of Roman statues, you'll notice a lot of the Roman statues all have one thing in common. They're usually missing their heads. And that's because zealous Jews would come by and decide, well, this is an, this is an, an idol. And so they would lop its head off. They just knock the head off. And so the, lo and behold, there are a lot of statues with no heads. If you look at them in, in, uh, in your, your uh, archaeological periodicals or books, you'll see that. So an image was not only prohibited, it was an anathema. It was a curse to the Jewish people. And so we see the image of the abomination in, in Exodus chapter 20. We'll study this since we're in the book of Exodus in the morning. We're going to study this factor and see what in the world uh, the Jewish people hate, why they hate images like this. So we see here a divine, or excuse me, a desecrating ravishment. But the third thing we see here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is his divine restraint. Okay? His divine restraint. His time and his power is limited by God. Even until the consumption, his defined conclusion, or his, con his conclusion is, his consummation, excuse me, his conclusion. And they gathered them together to the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. Now, folks, the Antichrist is going to have seven years that he is going to have a, a, not an unlimited, but he'll have a very strong control of the world. And the Bible says that it's all going to come to an end. It's going to come to a consummation and that consummation is when Christ comes back and destroys him we see his determined condemnation the Bible says is poured out on the desolate he desires to make all things desolate all things that are holy he wants to desolate he wants to desolate the church today folks the the desire of Satan that every church in the world would close that every church would become desolate I've seen pictures, I don't know if you have or not, of old churches out in the, out in the boonies, out in the, out in the, uh, the country somewhere, and they're all weather-worn, grayish looking, look like my grandfather's house. All, you know, he never believed in painting a house, it just was solid gray, it all just wore out, I guess. And that's, you know, that, that, that was the time. But the, these churches are just desolate. They're cobwebs, the windows are broken, the doors are hanging crooked, the pews are all broken up, everything. I went out to a church years ago with my grandfather, and it was a church that my family went to back in, after the Civil War, and it was absolutely desolate. I mean, there was nothing there, no pews, nothing in there. It was just a, a building that was considered condemned. And it was sad to think that people used to sing there. And people got saved there, and people got married there, and children were dedicated to the Lord there. What a tragedy, but that's what Satan wants. He wants to desolate the church. That's his, that's his whole life, so to speak. Well, Jesus told us in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come to give life and give it to you more abundantly. Satan comes to steal. He wants to steal what joy you have. He wants to steal what happiness you have. He wants to steal anything he can from us. He wants to steal. If he can't steal from you, then he's going to try to kill you. And if God does not give him permission to kill you, then lo and behold, he'll try to what? If he doesn't steal, he doesn't kill, he tries to destroy you. He tries to condemn you. And so we see this determined condemnation. God will destroy the satanic trinity. Daniel 7.11 says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, which is the Antichrist, watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Daniel says the Antichrist is going to come to his ruin. Look in Revelation 14.10. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So we see a destruction. Turn quickly to Mark 
chapter 13. Here in Daniel, we just saw in one verse, just one verse, the rise, the fall of the Antichrist. But in Mark, the very words of Jesus recorded here, the very first gospel ever written, Mark chapter 13, we're going to start with verse 14. Jesus is speaking to his apostles and followers. They're on the Mount of Olives. This is what is known as the Olivet Discourse. Uh, there is a, a discourse of this like in, in Luke and in Matthew and also here in, in Mark. In Mark chapter 14, we see the Bible saying, Chapter 13, verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation, what is that, preacher? That's when the Antichrist comes, places an idol of himself, an image of himself in the temple. And when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house nor enter to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now we see here in verse 14 a time of fulfilled prophecy. We see the Antichrist attack on the temple. So when you see the abomination of desolation, it's a warning of a specific event. So when you see. Now, beloved, you and I will not see that upon the earth. We'll be in heaven. But the Bible says that he's writing here, he's speaking to the Jews. The Jewish apostles, the Jewish disciples were asking Jesus very pointedly, what is the sign of your coming and when, it, when is the end of the age? And Jesus was speaking to the Jewish men upon the mountain about the Jewish time of the tribulation, known as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not known as the time of of the Christian's trouble. It's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a Jewish matter. So we see here it's a warning of a specific event, the actuality of the desolation. So when? And the acknowledgement of the, of, the, of the event. So when you see it, since 70 AD, this has not been a reality, has it? No temple, no nation, no abomination, but many... Many people who have believed and said, well, it's already happened. It hasn't. This is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking after the event of the Maccabee revolt has already happened. So what is he saying? It's going to happen again. Hanukkah is going to happen again. There indeed is the Hanukkah connection. This feast and, 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 and festival for the Jewish people has been before us for years, and we have failed to see it. We have failed to acknowledge it. We have failed to understand it and to study the need of it and why it's important. Oh, that's that Jewish thing where kids get uh, uh, gifts, eight days uh, gifts worth of gifts. No, it's talking about the abomination of desolation. May 14th, 1948 changed everything when the nation of Israel came back in the scene. It is the sign, the sign, folks, that we are living in the last days. There are many signs that are in the Bible that we can know that we are living in the last days. But you see, there, there hasn't been a nation of Israel since about 136 A.D., not until 1948. A people who had been scattered, a people who had been abused, a people who had been slaughtered, a people who had been mistreated and sent out into the far edges of the world, all began to come back in 1948, May the 14th, they became a nation again. If the nation was designed and built by God, so will the temple be. We see a warning of spiritual evil. The abomination of desolation will come, Jesus said. 
The defilement of the Antichrist evil is going to come. There's going to come one who is going to arise in these last days. He's going to come in peace. He's going to ride the white horse. He's going to have the bow of power with no arrow in it, meaning that he's going to take over the world, not firing a shot. He's going to tell everybody, I'm Jesus. He's going to tell everybody. That's why Jesus said in the last days there will be deception. They'll say, here is the Christ, there is the Christ. You don't believe it. I think it's a literal. I think it's literal that the Antichrist is going to say, I'm Jesus. I've saved you from the wrath of the Gog and Magog war. That was Armageddon, and lo and behold, I'm here to set up my kingdom. I believe it's all a part of it. I see the, we see the warning of a spiritual evil, the desecration of the Antichrist's evil, the presence of the Antichrist is pure evil because he represents Satan's world. He is the son of Satan, so to speak. Satan is a mimic. He mimics everything of God. As God sent his son into the world, you see, the, the, the John 3.16 of Satan is that Satan hated the world so much that he gave us his beloved Antichrist that whosoever believe in him shall perish from the face of the earth. Oh, that's the devil's John 3.16, isn't it? We see the presence of the Antichrist. John 10.10 10 again, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. It was a warning of spiritual evil, a warning of a specific event. And then in verse 14, it was a warning of sudden evacuation. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The audience of the directive, those in Judea, I believe that it was very important that God purposely points out Judea. Well, why is that? Well, you see, those in northern Israel are going to not be able to escape because the Antichrist army is already going to be up there. I think the Antichrist is going to tell Israel, I'm going to protect you. And what a better way for me to protect you than to bivouac my army in the nation of Israel. And where would you want to bivouac your army? Well, I think the best spot would be up there in that big plain area up there by the northeast, uh, northwestern Israel called, uh, uh, it is, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley, that would be a nice place. Oh, you mean Armageddon? <laughs> And so the northern Jewish people won't be able to escape because the, the army will be already there in Jerusalem. It's, this is the war of Jerusalem, and they'll come down and attack Jerusalem. This is not Armageddon. He says, flee to the mountains. The audience was the southern Israel, and they were going to escape. And folks, how would they escape? The abruptness of the departure. He says, flee. Don't take a bus. Don't, get, don't wait and get an airplane. Just flee. Get what you can and go. We see the excess of the departure to the mountains. That's south. Can't, can't go north. Go south. The only way of escape that will be open is the southern route. It would be almost an exodus, it, the exodus in reversal. Just as the exodus came from Egypt, it came up through that western area up, uh, the, the, excuse me, the eastern area up by Petra. And Petra said, no, you can't come through us. God is going to bring them back to Petra, and they're going to say, come on in. And so they'll go into the Petra area. Micah 2.12 says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. There'll be a lot of people, great noise. They'll go down to Bozrah, which is just right there by Petra. Bozrah is near Petra in the modern-day Jordan. And in Zechariah 13.8, it tells us that a third of the Jewish people will survive the abomination of desolation and escape to Petra. If it were today, it'd be approximately 2 million people, just like the exodus from Egypt. Zechariah 13.8 says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. And that is the remnant. Look in Daniel 13 once more at verse 17 and 18. We're going to continue to look here. In verse 17 and 18, this situational tragedies of the event. We note personal restrictions here in verse 17. 
Jesus said something very unique in verse 17. The Bible says, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Be careful, he says, if you're pregnant because it's going to be a rough ride. Okay, and then verse 18, we see a physical restrictions of verse 18 and pray that your flight be not in winter. Why? That's the rainy season. A lot of the wadis and the ways of escape are flooded out. So we see the situational tragedies. He said, I want you to flee. Don't go back and get your cloak. Don't go back and pack a suitcase. Don't go back and get your Cracker Jacks. Just go. Leave right away. Get out of this area. Go south. We see the situational tragedy of the event. I, I hope you're not pregnant, Jesus said. I hope you're not nursing baby because it's going to be hard on both of you. Not impossible, but hard. Don't go back into the house. If you're on the upper of the roof, the women worked on the upper roof area during the day and they did all that work up there and the cool breeze would come by and keep them cool. The men would be out in the field. He said to the women on the, on the roofs, don't go down and get what you need. Now, you know, women, you want to go down. And you say, well, now, maybe I got three or four pairs of shoes I'd like to take, right? Oh, they're not smiling. That was a joke. But anyway, well, I just blew that joke, didn't I? But anyway, you know, women, he says, don't go down and get anything. Women would place, okay, we need this. We maybe get a first aid kit, maybe do this and that. But you can't do that. You got to go. The men out in the field, don't go back home and get your cloak. Just go. Take off. Meet your family there, so to speak. Look at verse 19 and 20, the severe tribulations of the event. In verse 19, the Bible says, and For in those days there will be tribulations such as not been since the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, nor ever shall be. There is danger without equal. Folks, the two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die. If there's six million Jewish people today in Israel, that's four million Jews dying. That's almost the Holocaust again. Only this time it's in Israel. We see the danger without equal. Look at verse 20, a deliverance from eradication. In verse 20, he says, And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now, there's a lot of confusion about that term, the elect's sake. I've heard all my life how there are certain Christians who say, well, see, the Christians are going to be there during the tribulation. That elect is not the Christians. We are engrafted into the olive tree. We're taken out at the rapture. The elect's sake here is speaking about Jews. The Jewish people are still God's chosen people. For people to deny that the Jewish people are the elect people of God are those who choose to believe in replacement theology that the church replaced Israel, not happened. You and I are grafted in, engrafted into the olive tree, as Paul teaches in Romans. We're the wild branches that were engrafted into the olive tree. So there is a severe tribulation of the event. The last thing we see is the desolation of Hanukkah is simple. It's a desolation of the treaty. Daniel 9, 27, and he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. He's going to deny the Jewish people the right to worship in the temple. It's a desolation of the temple itself. Therefore, when you see the abomination of spoken of by Daniel, excuse me, the abomination of desolation, spoken of Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. That's in Matthew 24:15. Jesus said, if you see that desecration, not only of the treaty, but of the temple, understand you need to flee. And then finally, Hanukkah, the repeat of Hanukkah is a desolation of the tribes. We see here, the Bible says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. Just leave, go. We see the desolation of the tribes. Perhaps close to four million people will be killed by the Antichrist. What does this say? 
When you hear things about the temple being rebuilt, when you hear things about what we need is one ruler, when we hear things about global economies and global nations and global armies, folks, Jesus is coming soon. All these things we see, folks, these these uh, abominations that we are already seeing, not only in Israel, not only in Europe, but in America too. These abominations that are destroying the face of Christianity, destroying the church, all these abominations are telling us one thing. Jesus is coming soon. Hanukkah promised it would happen again. Jesus said Hanukkah would come again. So what is the great Hanukkah connection? It's simple. For the Jewish people, it's a tragedy. It's desolation once more. It's the Antichrist coming into the temple, destroying the temple, and making himself to be God. But for the Christians, both Jew and Gentile, it says one thing again. Jesus is coming soon. Question is, are we ready? Well, I believe everyone in this room is ready. I believe we're born again. I believe we wouldn't be here if we weren't. Sunday night? Come on now. But here's the issue, folks. Are our friends ready? Are our families ready? We have to be careful of that. Hanukkah is coming soon, beloved. And the world is not ready. And the Jewish nation is not ready. And a lot of people in our country are not ready. So we got a lot of work to do yet before we leave, do we not? Though Jesus said truly, the fields are white into harvest. Let's pray.